a tough house. Uh, it's a tough house. Uh, in my old drumming years from many, many years ago, we'd, we'd go out and we'd kind of evaluate the house, you know, before it started. And our standard line was, it's a tough house out there. <laughs> Well, you should have, <clears throat> excuse my voice, we should have one sheet that says week two, how can I best serve him? That's our theme for, God willing, this four-week series. Good morning, Mr. Bell. Good morning, sir. Just by way of review, last week we talked about being called out of the life of the first Adam. We're all born into it. No escape born into his nature, egocentric, selfish, self-centered. And in the moment, to be all moments, God comes to us. Some of us remember that, some of us received him so young they don't remember it, which is fine. But this great intersection of the atoms and I, I love to say it this way. I don't see where the Lord says to us, I want you to come and change. No, what he says is, I want you to come to me and die. And be reborn. And of course, the truth of that is there is this, I believe it's our brother Peter who says, we who have entered into that new life are now partakers of divine nature. After all these years, I still wrestle a lot with that. But I believe it and I seek daily to lay hold of it by faith. So Elaine, would you please come up and read by way of review our first brief portion from Romans chapter 12. God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. That means I need all of you. <laughs> This is uh, such a great provision in the new covenant in that we are called a, the members of a body. We're not those who are drawn by ceremony or obedience to the law only, but we're brought, we're brought by placement of the Spirit of God. And we're like, one analogy is we're like bricks or stones in a wall, fitted, framed together, to bring into the earth a different and a new and a pivotally important presentation of Jesus the Christ, and that is his functioning spiritual body. Wow, we've been called into a life to accurately represent and present him wherever and however he sends us. That's too much for me, but I believe it anyway. I do. And so, <clears throat> We are uniquely different. And it's taken me a long time, selfish here, particularly lead or, or serving with other men and women in leadership. There's a part of me, I suppose, in what I call the old days that wished that most of those men who I was serving with were a little bit more like me. In fact, the truth is I wanted to be more like me. And thankfully, they weren't. Yeah. Because it's that deposit of uniqueness in us that 
not only makes us different, but it makes us a broader presentation of himself. There's only so much of the Lord that I could ever hope to bring into focus for anyone. <clears throat> Joined with brethren, our likelihood of doing that is greatly increased. Oh, this is good. It's not in my notes, but that's good. Yeah. So, this week, we'd like to look at two of my favorite words. This week and next week is my third favorite word, but two of my favorite words that uh, are translated the word gift. And the words which the Holy Spirit uses to teach us of his gifts and how they are used to bring the Lordship of Christ into our lives. The first gift I want to talk about, or gifts I want to talk about, is from Ephesians chapter 4, and they're what the theologians call the ascendancy gifts. The ascendancy gifts. That which he gave once he returned into the heavenly realm. Elaine, could I get you to come and read Ephesians 4, please, 8 through 13? <clears throat> Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as prophets, and some as, uh, some as apostles, and some as prophets, some as evangelists, uh, evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Thank you, sweetheart. This uh, list of <clears throat> gifts is what some theologians call the five-fold ministry. And some theologians whom I greatly respect see it as four gifts, namely that the pastors and teachers is one gift. That's not particularly my persuasion, but I don't have a big argument with it. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Either four or five. Will you clarify this for us later? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> These gifts, well, let's look at the moment at the Greek word because there's a, there's a picture of it here. The word for gift in the Ephesians text is doma. And I like W. E. Vine's definition. He says, the doma stresses the concrete character of the gift rather than its beneficent nature. I like to consider it this way. The gifts in Ephesians 4 are people. They're men and women. And I dare say young men and women. They are individuals who are given to the church for a couple of wonderful reasons, if I can go back to our text toward the bottom. He gave these as for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. This, this challenges me because over the years I've had this picture when I think of an evangelist, for example. Who would you think about if I said, who's an evangelist of notoriety over the years? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. And I loved him and I love his family have a great regard for him. <clears throat> and we look at Dr. Graham in terms of what did he do with the call that was on his life and where it took him. The many, many, many folks who sat under his ministry and received from him. And we say, okay, the work of an evangelist 
is to help the, the saved get the, the lost get saved. And yet, Paul says that part of the work of any of these men or women is to equip. That is to bring something to the church at large, which is after God's heart, along the line, in this case, of winning folks to the Lord. I think, for example, looking a moment at uh, pastors, I love the pastoral gift in the church. I love it dearly. Part of that gift is to serve as an under-shepherd to the church family that that individual has been sent to. But another part of it is to equip those whom he's sent to with a shepherd's heart. Can you see the, the other side of this? It's not just fulfilling a particular aspect of the ministry, but it's calling and enabling others to find their place of service and joining. One of the things I like to say from time to time is it doesn't take a prophet, as one of the other individuals, it doesn't take a prophet to raise up a prophet. What it does is it takes a man or a woman of God to contribute to the raising up of a prophet or whatever. You, you serve beyond what your specific gift may look like. Wow. I like this. I want this just to hit with us. You don't, you don't have to be as apt and able and bright or whatever to serve those whom God is sending you to. Wow. It's a good thing, isn't it? Good thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I've, I've had opportunity to, my, to be served by a brilliant theologian. I think by evangelist. I think by prophet. And where I was on the scale of brightness or intellect or, or where they were in those same scales, it wasn't important. It was that those individuals were bringing me what they had been given to bring. And you have that entrustment. Don't let your excess of or lack thereof hold you back. on either direction. Maybe you have a chance to serve someone who is seemingly just undone, just in the gutter, way below where you want to live, as it were. God puts that in your heart. You're the one to go. Okay, I'll leave that there. So this, this concept of doma, it's the person. Now, the second word in our notes here for, for gift, we talk about the, what's called the charisma, charismatic or the charismata gifts. And Wayne, would you please come once more and read from 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Can I make a comment? Please, <laughs> please. There are times over the years that I've seen you prophesy, and I've also seen you be do some evangelistic type of work, but you're not a prophet and you're not evangelist. Because I think there's times when the Spirit can come upon us and we can all do that. Good. And we're all called to evangelize, but it doesn't make us an evangelist. Wonderful. That's Is that a, a correction? No, that's just oh, okay. a thought. I'm just checking. Because <laughs> I, get, I get confused with that sometimes. That's good. That's well said. Now please go back to your notes. <laughs> now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 
For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And I've seen you do pieces of each one of those. And to another the effect of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another of various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. Thank you. I'm not sure that there's any portion of scripture that I have meditated on more than this text. I love it dearly. Uh, there are, I think, I think in the immediate text, there are nine gifts that are referred to. The scripture has quite a few more. <clears throat> Many years ago, I read a book by, um, I'm not gonna get his name now, Identify Your Spiritual, Identifying Your Spiritual, Peter, Wagner. Peter Wagner, thank you. And um, as I recall, he felt that there were 28 charismata in the scripture. Lowly me, I've never been able to find all of those, but I've read after, I've taught from that book over the years, and uh, I really appreciate much of his insight into what the charismata represent. Okay, the Greek word here is charisma, from the Greek word charis, which is grace. Charis in Greek means grace. So these are objects. Charisma is an object of the grace of God. And I like what W.E. Vine says. He says, a gift of grace upon sinners which his endowments, excuse me, his endowments upon believers by the operation of the Holy Spirit in the churches. Can we dig out a difference between the two words? Remember, Noma is the individual. It's what the Lord Jesus is building of himself by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in you. Uh, not to pick on our pastor for just a moment. Pastor John, could you? You don't have to leave the room, but just don't listen. Go over your notes. <laughs> Go somewhere else. But I, I dare say, and I did not know Pastor John in the earlier years here, but I dare say that during the years of his serving, even in this city, that the Lord Jesus was about fashioning his life in him, ultimately, for us. The same dynamic is in you. Before you sat here, before you came to Corpus Christi, there was that fashioning of the Son of God in you to prepare you to be a servant in this place and in the city. I love it. I love that we are the benefactors of what God is doing in one another. Thank the Lord. Now, so the Doma, going back just a moment, is the person in whom that is unfolding. The charisma is less an operation of the person that you see and more an operation of the Spirit of God through that person. It's, I love this word dearly, it's an entrustment in a given situation to serve the cause of Christ in which you're working and living your life. Doma, the person. Charisma, the operation of the Spirit of God through you. My goodness. Hmm. I wonder, I want to take a moment and, and share an example of that from my own experience, if I may. This particular counter goes way back into the early 70s. We were all much younger then. Some of us weren't here yet. And uh, we were members of a newly formed church in a little city in, in New Hampshire called Laconia. 
Now, in New England, we always pronounce everything incorrectly, so we put R's on everything. So we, we would pronounce it Laconier New Hampshire. Still trying to get over that. And this, this, this work had actually, I think, been born the night that David Wilkerson came to Laconia for a one-night visit. The old Colonial Theater, I remember it like it was yesterday. That was in May of 1970. And uh, David had a, an amazing, may I say, doma gift, the person in him, who he was. But he came and, uh, oh my goodness, I don't think I'd ever met, I was a very, very new believer. I don't think I'd ever met anyone who was really as strong, even as stern as David could be. And uh, I remember sitting up on the balcony with a dear friend who had helped me recently come to the Lord, Bob Sanborn, bless his heart. And we were sitting there, and, and in back of us there was a group of very rowdy teenagers. And I, I don't know to say or do or think, I'm just sitting there. And a couple moments, Brother Wilkerson picked up on that. He stopped, stepped away from his microphone and pointed up to them. And very sternly, basically said to them, get out of your seats and get out now. There's nothing that I've brought tonight here that is for you. Get out. It was even stronger than that, a lot stronger than that. And I'm sitting here saying to myself, well, there goes the Holy Spirit. He'll never be able to work in this environment now. It's all broken. It's all gone. But exactly the opposite was true. I remember saying one time to a friend, the Holy Spirit cannot work where there's conflict. Oh, really? Where'd you find that in the scripture? He, he went on to uh, speak his piece, and I saw many folks who I went on to know over the years in our church came forward and received the Lord Jesus that night. It was wonderful. But something else happened that night. When he left, I didn't get a chance to meet him, or, but when he left, he left a deposit in that city that within a matter of days birthed a new church. Yeah. The church was, was then called New Christian Fellowship. For some errant reason, the brothers asked me to be one of the elders of it. I'm too young to do that, but sometimes you grow in the fire, don't you? And so we began to serve, and after a couple of years, the Lord sent us a young brother from Corpus Christi named Jack Carter and helped us a great deal to come along in the things of God, as well as become my mentor in the faith, as well as my dear friend. But going on from there, within a short while of that, we had a an outside uh, gathering of two or three different churches in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. You know, Elaine goes, oh, well, anyone from Pittsfield that might watch this, don't be offended, but Pittsfield is kind of out of the way. <laughs> and uh, it was outside, and everyone was camping, and it was a great time, and I remember going out in the fields and praying before, asking the Lord to come and be about us. So we got started and shared some different things and then a couple of the brothers asked me to share for a few minutes and I was sharing that I wanted to pray for some folks. So I invited folks who might want to come for prayer and that went on for a few minutes and then there was a young lady, teenage lady, came and stood in front of me. I've, I've only had this happen once in my life, all these years, only once. I 
don't think the Holy Spirit rubber stamps things. Well, this worked good. Let's try the same thing again. <laughs> He's more creative than that, putting us in an environment that, that reflects his great creativity and uniqueness. But this one, now early evening, this young lady stood in front of me, and as was my want after sharing with her for a minute, I went to place my hand on her forehead to pray for her. That's what I wanted to do. She had come asking for prayer. Now, what I want to share with you in the next couple moments, I think may qualify for what we would call the word of knowledge. Definition of the word of knowledge. That which provides information about a situation, a person, <coughs> circumstance, or a solution. It can also reveal hidden secrets, what God has done, what God is doing, what God might do. I think it's a good definition of that phrase, word of knowledge. Stepping into something by the Spirit of God which you don't really know quite what he's doing right here. Please don't be afraid of that. Look for, trust him, learn of his voice, and obey him. And so here stood this young lady, and as I went to pray for her, there was a real drawing back in me. And I looked at her a moment, and I saw something I've never seen this except once. Like someone had fashioned a rubber stamp, one word, and taken it and stamped her forehead with dark ink. I looked at her forehead and I saw one word. Unforgiveness. And I, I could hear the Spirit of God saying, don't go forward with what you have in your heart for her right now. Listen from my heart. If I had stepped over what he was doing, that young lady would not have been served with what was then on my heart. So I stepped back a moment, and now this is where you find out how really brilliant I am. <laughs> Can you imagine saying to this young lady, so, um, sis, do you, do you have any unforgiveness in your heart? Isn't that wise, huh? <laughs> I, I couldn't think of anything brighter to say. <laughs> and she started to begin to weep like a little child. Just and she proceeded briefly through her tears to say she had a real difficulty with another sister or friend. And so, could I suggest that the Lord won't lead you in a situation where it hits a wall and we can't help someone. There's where you can believe that the answer to the situation lies within this environment right now because he brought us here. And so I asked the next brilliant question. I said, so is this person here tonight? And she said, so there's a line now waiting for folks to be prayed for. I said, would you do me a big favor? Would you go and would you make that right with her and then please come back? So off she went. We continued on and I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes later, here she comes with her friend. And obviously they both had been profoundly touched with what that little girl had gone to her friend with. Boy, I would like to go to people with what God is touching me with, wouldn't you? Wow. And so, I couldn't think of much more intelligent to say. I think I might have said something like, so is, is, is everything right now? And they were very clear on that. So we had a brief time of say the Lord met them there and there was a wonderful 
blessing upon them, which came out of, I think, the Lord sharing something with someone who needed to see what he was seeing and others were missing. And to know how to cooperate with him to proceed. Everything I share with you, there's no astuteness in me about that. There's no, oh boy, where'd you get those fancy words? No, no, we, we, can, we can fulfill what God has begun to touch others with. We can fulfill our part of that. Oh dear. And just parenthetically, the word of wisdom kind of goes hand in glove with this because the word of knowledge provides information about something. The word of wisdom shows you what to do with it. That's the short of it. I might talk a little bit more about that next week. Elaine, you had a question. Is it gone now or is it still? Would you please come up? Please, be easy on me now. I, I often think that we're born with, with a, comp a, a, a competency or some talents that maybe might be in music or in hospitality or something. Um, does the Lord then turn that into a gift or use it or are, are they in parallel or not? How's that? That's terrific. Yeah. <laughs> Would you go sit down now, please? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> I don't think there's anything in us that turns into a spiritual gift. I think there are, this is a dreadful non-biblical word here, but I can't think of a better one. I think there are wirings in us. I think God, when he brings us into the earth, wires us with some ways, some aptitudes, some talents, um, that he can come at his choosing and deposit something that draws from who you've been now in him. But that gift has a unique place because it's not really a full representation of you. It's a partial representation of him. So it's not something that morphs from who you have been. But I think so often it cooperates with how God has prepared you to receive it. There, that is a good word right there. So in Elaine's case, she has had a wonderful gift in music over the years and a wonderful gift in uh, teaching communication. When I met her, she was teaching for a large international corporation, um, digital corp then digital corporation. She was very, very good at what she did. I remember times I'd have to go to the airport in Boston and put her on a plane for England for the week. I'd say, please come back to me. I'm still a work in process. God isn't done with me yet. Please, don't give up. But she, she also has had this gift in music. And I know over the years there's been a sorting out, if you will, of, okay, do the gifts of God, either do they come from that or do they take advantage of that or whatever? It's not an easy answer because sometimes the answer is God will use that and I think there are times when he doesn't choose to. I've mentioned to you in my younger years as being a drummer and a musician, I, I loved those years, serving different venues from age 14 to 27. I loved those years. My mother was a musician and a band leader. Um, but there was nothing he ever took from that and brought into what I was to be who I was to become. On the other side of the coin, I remember perhaps in the eighth or ninth grade in junior high or high school, in my English class, it was the only good mark in 
my report card I ever got was in English and in communication. And I remember coming home and giving this terrible report. I would suggest if you get a report like that, hide it from your mom, don't let her see it. <laughs> I tried that. And they were all bad marks except for English. And I remember saying to my mom one time, as a young, as a boy, well, what good would this ever be? I, that's not anything that would ever be valuable to me, to be able to speak and share thoughts and communicate. But there was a wiring going on there. It's a bad word. There was a, what's a better word? There's a natural bent. Good, natural bent that was supernatural in that way. You, we do know that God didn't begin working with us the day we got saved, don't we? It's a good thing. Otherwise, my first 27 years and 11 months would have been completely wasted. But as it turns out, the king was fashioning before I knew him. Isn't that encouraging? Wow. Some of that coming through our parents were sowing such wonderful seeds in their children. Not knowing all that that's going to look like later on. But nonetheless, there is a, that's a wonderful contribution for you. beyond, that's not H-O-L-E, that's W-H-O-L-E, the whole which is called the body of Christ. How would it ever be from the foundation of the earth that the Lord would intend to place me in that wall, you in that wall? I'm not sure that I will understand that any time before we go home. But it's the truth. And I, my hourglass is almost, all the sand is almost on the bottom now. Almost. It's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to have a chance to share with you folks these four weeks. Hopefully to encourage you, not with my life, but with your life. Father, thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more thing next week. My favorite third word. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it was very, very active in the Lord Jesus. This word that we'll look at next week. And here's the encouragement. Two encouragements. Number one, everywhere this word occurred in his ministry, something supernatural always happened. The scripture encourages us to partake of that same ministry. Can't wait till next week. I'll be thinking about us all week. And you're not going to tell. I'm not going to tell you the word. You're good. You're good at it. Sis? <laughs> but it's worth the wait. Sis? I think they're both good, yeah. That which, when you look at how God has placed his life in you, even before rebirth, you see these things. They were covered over in Adam's life before, but now they're free to become what God has for them. Amen. I love it. Pete? I recall Eric Little used to know chariots of fire. Uh, he polishes them, you know, 
silence along with that. <laughs> <laughs> Father, thank you so much for our time together. We so much appreciate and delight and take heart in your, your commitment to us, your word, your spirit, leading us along in all that you have fashioned in us and are doing with and through us. Thank you for blessing me.